This is Mountain Blade to Bannerlord and if you've clicked on this video you've probably just caught a castle or a city and you're wondering how you can fix the fact everybody is currently starving. So in this video I'm going to be explaining exactly how you can do that and it's actually very easy but I've seen a lot of people across the internet suggesting the wrong thing to do so I just wanted to make a video explaining how it actually works and also explaining how the entire castle and city management system works because this is a city management system a castle management system is slightly different the only difference is that you can build gardens and some other different items so let's start off talking about the main reason you've probably clicked on this video which is how to stop your people starving and then I'll go into details about exactly how the management system works and some little secret tips you can kind of use to your advantage. So starting out um, I've just captured Revar the city and when I had it under siege the city started to starve as you guys can see it currently has no food and it's still losing food currently. Now this obviously reduced the army's morale however we now own the city so we need to fix this for ourselves. So let's go to the manage town option just here. Now the first thing you're going to notice is on the top right here there are bound villages. So, so not only are we managing the city but we're also managing the local two villages just here. Now I can see what the villagers are actually producing here. It says primary production of fish and the other village has a primary production of grain. Which is actually kind of good because this means our city is going to recover a lot faster because the local villagers are producing food anyway. If I go over the food section just here I can see one of the local villagers is producing some food for the city and the lands around the settlement are also producing food. However, the other village isn't actually here. So if I exit out quickly and have a look, I can see Kaba, the local village, has been raided by me actually uh, before I caught the city. Um, so actually, currently it's not really producing us any food. So that's the reason why we have minus a lot of food there. This other village we have though, which is part of our castle, is fine. So we don't need to worry about that one. So let's go back to managing it. And right now we can see the situation is quite bad and it's going to take a few days to recover anyway. But essentially from the food menu we can see exactly where all our food is coming from and how much we have and how much we're getting. We can also see that Prosperity has minus 52.8 impact on food. Prosperity is essentially the people living in your kingdom. Um, and each one of these things, loyalty, food, militia, has an effect on one another. But if we look at Prosperity, currently we are losing Prosperity because we have a food shortage and that's giving minus 12 to our Prosperity. So essentially if we solve our food shortage, we will solve our Prosperity issue. Also, we can have a look at loyalty. We're still getting plus one, but minus two um, because people are starving and also another minus two because local villagers have been looted. And then we have militia, which is very important to talk about quickly because your local militia is essentially your local defense force. If you have a high militia rating, then your villagers will be protected from looters and armies and so on. If you've ever tried to loot a village in Mountain Blade, to Bannerlord, you'll know that sometimes the villagers have local militia forces that will defend the village against you. So having a high militia rating is very important. You can also defend them manually yourself by walking around the map in the local area and killing local looters and raiders. So the main issue here is the food production. How are we going to solve this very quickly? So the first thing I'm going to want you to do is look at your daily defaults. Now these are basically things that increase the production by plus one of lots of different things it's what your ta it's what your city or castle and villages are currently focused on so you can choose to build houses which gives you plus one bonus to prosperity but we know that currently we're losing prosperity because we've got a food shortage you can also train militia which is quite beneficial because it gives us plus one to militia bonus which will then help us defend our villagers from getting looted again. But currently it's not something we want to focus on. 
Um, festivals and games gives you plus one to settlement morale. Probably the least useful thing right now. But irrigation is the most important thing we want to select as soon as we've caught the castle. Because it gives us plus one bonus to food production. Which is key. Production of food. So choosing irrigation is going to improve the food situation slightly. The next thing we're going to do is double check... Go to your keep and then manage your garrison. Now currently I only have a few people in the town's garrison. If I go ahead and add the like a lot of people into the garrison and then I leave and then I come back and I manage the town again, you can see the food's now gone to minus 13. So essentially the more people you have in the garrison, the more minus food you're going to get as well. So it's recommended while your castle or city is starving that you go ahead and take everybody out of the garrison and just leave the town pretty much empty. And now you can see the garrison size is no longer having effects on the food of the settlement. Now, a word of warning when you're doing this, obviously, if you think you might be attacked, then it's still worth garrisoning the, garrisoning the castle. But the more people you have, the more minus you will get to the food production. Now, another thing you can do to uh, solve the food shortage situation is you can go to the trade tab just here. And in this tab, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see exactly how much food your city has. To be honest, we have tons of fish, so we should really be fine because our villagers are still producing fish as well. We don't have any grain though, and one thing you can do if your city or castle has no food is you can go and trade food to the local villagers. So for example, if my city didn't have any food, I could go and sell them some grain. They still give you money for the grain, um, and then they're going to have grain in their inventory, and that's going to slowly allow them to recover their food deficit, because they won't be lacking in food. Another thing you can do is, say for example, this village down here, you can go and visit it, and you can trade to your local villagers, and you can give them food, because they're also part of this small economy going on here. Currently though, this city is burning, so we can't interact with it. We can't sell it food at the moment. Now, let's talk about the projects tab. This is essentially what you can build in your city. Now, I've seen so many people telling everyone to build a granary after you capture a castle, but don't do that. Please don't do that because a granary, as you can see on the bottom right there, it says it gives you plus 20 bonus to food stocks, okay? So basically what happens is when you're in positive food, you have a cap, a limit of 100 food if you don't own a granary. If you build a level 1 granary, you'll have a limit of 120 food. But that's completely useless to you at the moment because everyone's starving. You're nowhere near the cap of a food limit so a granary doesn't help you make food it helps you store food so don't build a granary okay what you want to focus on at least in cities i'll talk about castles in a moment is lime kilns okay lime kilns are going to give you a plus 10 bonus to village production uh, at rank one um, and it's basically lime kilns are basically like a form of fertilizer that increases farming production now, if you go back on food here, you'll see that one of our local settlements that isn't burning is giving us plus 12 to our food. And also the lands around the settlement are giving us plus 10. Now, as soon as we increase our lime kilns by um, building some more, we're going to increase the production further, which means we're getting more um, food from our villagers. So that and irrigation is how you're going to solve your food shortage. And just so you guys know, when you press the plus sign, it's going to start building it and the hammer hitting it means that it's building it currently. If you go ahead and start building something else, then it will have a one next to it, which means it's second in the queue to be built, as you guys can see here. Um, if you want it to be built now, though, you can press this little button here and it will cancel everything in your queue and start building the granary. But obviously, we want the lime kilns to be built. So let's make those our priority. That's how the construction works, essentially. Now, in order to build the lime kilns as quickly as possible, um, you can have a look here at your daily production. Currently, we have 85. If you want to increase your daily production, you just need to add some more gold into the reserve. It costs you 500 gold to double your daily production speed for one day. 
So every day I'm going to have, you know, double daily production and we're going to get these lime kil kilns built as soon as possible. Currently it says the completion is one day 115%, which kind of doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to complain. It must have almost been built anyway when we came and raided the city. Now that is for a city though, obviously. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run down to the castle. So you'll see that the management system is slightly different. So I go to manage castle. This is what the castle screen looks like. Now you can also build lime kilns in a castle. However, it's much more effective and cheaper to build gardens. As you guys can see, gardens give plus one to food production and they only have a production cost of 20, which means if I say I want to build this, it's only going to take me one day to actually complete the production of it. And then you want to come back and upgrade your gardens to level three as soon as possible. That will give you plus three food production alone. And you can also see on the food here that these local villagers are producing food for the castle so you know we've got a lot of plus food production and prosperity is also fine so you know everything's going positively well in this castle because we captured it quite a little like a little while ago now it will take you a little while by the way like a few days or even a week or so to turn around the food production and make it you know into the positive again so let's go back to our city and i'm going to go through everything in the city and what it does So just so you guys understand how this works, we can see a trade caravan here and also our own villagers that are coming from Ustakol, which I think is another town I own all the way down here somewhere. Those peasants are actually coming to trade goods. So what will happen as time progresses and the city is no longer under siege, we go back to the managed town, your food supply is going to go up just because of trade. So as you guys can see now, Kabar is now actually providing grain to the city. That grain is giving us plus 20 food. So as you can see, our loyalty is going up, our military is going up, and our prosperity is also going up because people aren't starving anymore. So now I'm going to go over all the things you can build in the city and which ones are the best, specifically for food production as well. So firstly, we have fortifications. Now this city already has the max amount of fortifications. That gives us plus 100 bonus to garrison capacity. Better fortifications and higher walls around town also increase the max garrison limit since it provides more space for the resident troops to stand on the walls. And this, you know, if you actually siege a castle and it has um, level 1 walls versus level 3 walls, you actually see a physical difference. Like, you actually see that the castle is a lot bigger or smaller than it is if it doesn't have this upgrade. So it actually does make a difference when you attack something as well or defend it. Um, then we have fairgrounds, so a permanent space that hosts fairs. Citizens can gather and drink, dance and socialise, increasing the daily morale of the settlement. Plus four bonus to settlement morale. Now this is good for prosperity, but also if the castle's under siege and the army inside, you know, have a better morale than if they are not there. Um, so fairgrounds are decent, though I wouldn't say they're like the most important thing to be building, uh, at least not early on unless you have nothing else to build. Next we have Militar Barracks, this is really important. Provides battle training for citizens and recruits them into the Militar. Increases daily Militar recruitment, a plus four bonus to Militar. But as you guys can see, I have 72 Militar at the moment. Because of that, level three Military Barracks and that's getting a plus four bonus. Now this Militar essentially protects your settlements around the area, like the local villages. It means that there are going to be men there defending a village so militar are really important especially if you want to increase food production and get protection from uh, local looters and stuff next here we have the siege workshop so this is different to a normal workshop basically the siege workshop is dedicated to sieges it contains tools and materials to repair walls build and repair siege engines so whenever your castle is under siege you'll notice that your castle starts building ballista and catapults within the castle that then can try and attack the enemy siege engines and also repair the walls before the battle begins because if you don't have a siege workshop then what you'll find is the enemy will build siege engines they'll attack your wall they might 
break apart in the wall, and then when they do attack you, they'll just be able to run through your wall, and your defences will be pretty useless, so siege workshops are very important. Next we have the garrison barracks, lodging for the garrison troops. Each level increases garrison capacity of the stronghold by plus 50. So essentially what this does is if I go to the keep and I go to manage garrison, the garrison currently has a cap of 337. You can increase this even further if you want. But again, it's not imperative. So next we have training fields. This is really good for like a long-term gameplay. The field is for military drills and it increases the daily experience gain of all garrisoned units. So currently we have this at level one. Uh, and what that means is that any troops that are in the garrison currently will get experience for being there. So if, for example, I leave these troops in the garrison, they will actually gain experience. So the Sturgeon recruits, for example, can actually level up and become useful without me potentially killing them in another battle. Next, though, we have Marketplace. So this just gives you a plus 10 bonus to taxes. Essentially, what that means is that you're going to be making more money from settlements you have this within because they just make more money from taxes. So you get more income. Um, why would you not want more income? I don't know. So Aqueducts is the next thing. They give us a bonus to prosperity change. Now, as you guys can see, prosperity, if I have a look over this, the aqueducts are giving that plus one bonus and the surplus of food is giving a plus two bonus and the market goods are as well. So this just essentially means that people remain happy and you have to worry about, you know, rebellion a lot less. Uh, next, we have the forum, an open square in the settlement where people can meet, spend time and share their ideas, increasing influence of the settlement's owner. So this, if you own the settlement, this will give you daily influence. So influence is just down here. Um, I actually own my own kingdom. So influence, I have tons of it. It's not an issue for me at all. But if you don't own your own kingdom and you own a city within someone else's kingdom, daily influence can be a whole like really really useful to you because it means that you can you know request more castles you can create more armies and you just have more power essentially so it's really good if you don't own your own kingdom but for me it's not very important next we have the granary as i kind of already explained the granary just increases your food stock limit which is just here um, so it's not actually essential, but it is useful because it means you can last longer in times of war. Next, we have the workshops, a building which provides the means required for manufacture or repair of buildings, improves projects, development speed, and also stones masons reinforce the walls. So this will actually also help you a little bit in times of siege, not as much as the siege workshop, but it will still help you. It gives you plus one bonus to hammers. So if you want to increase your production speed, you can improve your workshop and then you can start building things. Once again, it's not essential. It is useful though. Next, we have lime kilns. Now, this is really, really good. So if I upgrade my lime kiln again, I'll increase the production of those villagers even more and allow them to produce even more food for my city, which will sort out any food issues that I might have. And that is essentially how everything in the projects tab works. You can also, which I haven't spoken about, add a governor to the city. Now, the governor of the city can have um, an influence on the prosperity. It can make a minus prosperity if the governor you choose for the city. Now, the two most important things when looking for a companion who's a good governor, they're traits. So as you can see... Um, Agna the Shield Maiden is honest, she has valor, she actually shows some kind of cruel mercy. So if they have a negative trait, then they may have a negative influence on the city, but she has two positive ones, so it should be okay. If they're generous, it can also give the city benefits as well. The second thing you're going to work, look at for um, a good companion to have as a governor is their social abilities and their intelligence so for example medicine is going to increase the speed that people heal up who are wounded in your settlement or your garrison if you have a governor who has a high medicine skill it will increase that speed engineering does affect it if you have um, a companion who's a high engineering skill and they're defending the uh, castle or the city then you'll be able to build siege engines a lot faster 
Next, we have Steward. This is the most important one. And if your follower has a high intelligence skill and you leave them as the governor of a city, then they will improve their stewardship skill. Um, so you can increase that as well. Improve settlement prosperity and build projects. Governor. Spend time in your settlements as a clan leader and you will um, improve your stewardship rating. Now, the most important things, though, are if she is a governor with a high steward skill, you'll have different perks that you can unlock. Now, the most important thing to look at here, the perks that have a little bracket that says governor inside it, because those are the governor perks. So 10% more tax from villagers, for example. Alternatively, you have personal perks which give you a 30% more production from farms that you own, uh, which are good for your own character. But if you have, for example, uh, a companion who is in charge of a city, this won't affect the city at all because it's a personal perk. So I'll let you go into detail on these perks and figure out what one is best for you. But honestly, my recommendation and what I've been doing across all my holds is actually having no governor at all. Because if you have no governor, it doesn't really affect anything, to be honest. And if you do put one of your companions as a follower, you'll lose them as a companion and they'll have to sit inside one of your many cities when you do end up building up, you know, a whole empire with uh, lots of towns, castles and cities and so on. So in my opinion, just don't bother adding a governor right now um, unless you have someone who's really good, who has really good perks or a really high intelligence skill. So to give you guys an example of a bad governor, I am very deceitful because I've been killing or executing all of my enemies. So this actually has a negative influence on towns that I am a governor of. So currently I'm in Of Castle and I am the governor of this. And as you guys can see, we're getting a minus one to loyalty and we're now at zero because minus two to governor's culture because I'm a bad person. So the city are like, oh, I'm scared of this guy. You know, I don't want him to be the leader of us. Uh, you also see a minus one prosperity change because our loyalty is going down as well. But everything else is absolutely fine. It's just because we have a negative governor. So you shouldn't have a bad governor as your city's leader. It's better to have none instead of just having yourself. But if I go ahead and leave the town now and then come back and uh, manage it, you can see now we're getting plus one loyalty and prosperity is also going to go up once the loyalty goes up as well. Um, and daily production will no longer be minus five. I don't even know how that's happened, to be honest. So the next thing we're going to do, guys, is we're going to go over to my castle just here. And I'm going to talk to you about the difference between castles and whatnot. That there are essentially very similar things here. For example, we also have a wool. We also have a granary. Castellan's office is a different thing, though. So let's talk about that. This provides a warden to the castle who maintains discipline and law, so rebellions find it harder to form. They also act as a captain to the militia and a steward to the castle who supervises the castle's inhabitants. This gives you a minus 50% reduction to militia during rebellion. So if your prosperity is really low, for example, it will reduce the chances of you having an issue with your militia and you'll still be able to defend your castle. So it's okay, but to be honest, you hopefully won't be in that situation. Next, we have workshops, um, fairgrounds, siege workshops, military barracks, barracks and training fields, which we've already spoken to. But here we have something new. Gardens. Gardens are once again really important for food production. So you can see currently what gardens essentially do is they increase your food produ production again. And as you can see, the production cost of gardens is tiny. Anyway, guys, I hope you found this Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord guide insightful and helpful. If you did, please do give it a like. I really would appreciate that. I've done a guide on like every principle of the game to explain how it works, like how you can create a huge army and manage your kingdom. And I'll link all of those separate guides down below. And if you're struggling on anything specific, let me know and I'll make another guide about that too. I want to be as informative, precise and quick in these videos as possible, but there's a lot to get through and explain. Um, and I think, you know, it seems like you guys really appreciate them. So thank you so much for your support and comments. I'm just saying thank you because, I mean, it's the reason why I'm doing these videos because uh, you guys enjoy them and find them helpful. Uh, if you want to watch my Let's Play as well, um, which is quite funny, we're going around killing all the nobles and wiping out Sturgia's whole lineage. 
I think I'm like, I've killed half of their family so far. Uh, you can check that playlist out linked below as well. But thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day. Goodbye.